The Office of the Controller General is proud to present uh, these, this series of uh, uh, armchair discussions uh, in collaboration with CPA Canada and the Institute of Internal Audit. Uh, and I just wanted to thank our uh, guests for being here. And without uh, further ado, I guess I will turn over to Jennifer to continue with uh, today's event. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Roger. So let's talk about leadership. We're delighted to have three great speakers with us today, senior leaders who've agreed to share their, uh, their views and their own experience on, uh, on our theme today, earning and uh, most importantly, keeping a seat at the management table. So our first panelist is Carmen Abella. Uh, Carmen is the Managing Director of Winreach Consulting Services, Inc. She has nearly 20 years of experience advising senior leaders on public sector oversight, accountability, and operational excellence. And uh, Carmen is a Chartered Director, and in her spare time, she volunteers a little bit with the IIA. She's actually the chairman of the board for IIA Canada. She was elected in September 2014. Welcome, Carmen. Thank you. Notre prochaine invité est Liette Dumas Luther, commissaire adjointe des services corporatifs et dirigeante principale des finances au service correctionnel du Canada, un poste qu'elle occupe officiellement depuis avril 2011. Avant cette nomination, Liette a occupé le poste de dirigeante principale de la vérification. Donc, elle nous parlera aujourd'hui en grande connaissance de cause. Euh, fait intéressant, Liette était la première euh, CAI au, euh, en poste au ministère. Liette possède plus de 30 ans d'expérience au sein de la fonction publique, où elle a acquis une vaste expérience à titre de cadre supérieur dans les domaines de la vérification, de la conformité, de la gestion du rendement et de la gestion financière. Bienvenue, Liette. Our third panelist is Simon Kennedy. Simon was named Deputy Minister of Health Canada, effective January 21st in 2015. Previously, he served as the Deputy Minister of International Trade in Canada G20 Sherpa, where he oversaw the trade portfolio through one of the most productive period in the history of the Canadian trade negotiations. So he's going to talk to you from a negotiation and influencing point of view, hopefully, today. Simon began his career with the public service in 1990 in a variety of roles uh, at different departments, including Transport Canada, the Canadian Coast Guard, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the Privy Council Office, and Industry Canada. We look forward to hearing his views as a DM, but also as a corporate director from a governance perspective. Welcome, Simon. So I'd like to start by asking our uh, panelists to maybe take a couple of minutes to share some initial thoughts on, on the theme of the, the day based on uh, their own experience and maybe um, from the expectations of their current role right now. So maybe we'll start with uh, Carmen. Sure. Thank you uh, very much, Jennifer, and thanks all of you to being here. To me, uh, both from a personal perspective but also from an institute perspective, the discussion we're going to have today is among the most important things that we need to be discussing in our community. Uh, I'll come at things from the internal audit side, uh, less from the finance side, of course, but, uh, but I think the themes are common and, and significant. And the, and the reason I find it so important is this. I'm, I'm worried about the internal audit community right now, and not just in the public sector, but generally speaking, that we have uh, very, very important demands on us, and particularly on the clients we serve. The stakes are high and critical to our ability to discharge that function effectively, incredibly, are the people. Uh, the people that work uh, every day, the operational folks who do the audits and do the consulting activities, but absolutely critical, the leaders that, that, that drive them and inspire them and oversee them. And you know, I can reflect, uh, I think it's fair to say often, often enough I get asked from various parties, you know, who would be the next greatest CAE, who's coming up the pipe, or what CAE would be good for X position. And increasingly, I have to say with, a, with, with the candor, if, if you'll allow me, um, it's getting harder and harder to answer those questions. So the pool is, as you know, all of you know, is thin. The issues are, are many and varied. And so we need to really have good discussions about development. There is definitely technical development that needs, that is, that is ongoing and is, and is, uh, is uh, still needed to be done, but the more difficult bit, the harder part to train, if you can even train for it, is the leadership side, the soft side. And we're going to talk a lot about that today in terms of what are the competencies, what are the, what's the acumen that is needed. And in reflecting on my, um, my 
preparation for today, it, it was a tough one, I have to say. It was really hard to figure out what is the secret sauce? What is that magic that, you know, when I, we see good executive presence, we know it. Uh, when we don't see it, we also know it. Uh, but developing to that is not easy. And I, I have some ideas which I'll be happy to share with you in a moment. But uh, really, really excited to be here and have the, the dialogue with all of you on that, that challenge. Merci, Carmen. Yeah. Alors, bonjour, uh, good afternoon. Um, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, it's 30 years in the public service as of a uh, couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I can't believe how fast it went for me. Uh, but I've been very fortunate. I've had a very interesting career. Uh, and I have played in two of my passion, one being audit. I've been an external auditor and internal auditors for many years. And more recently, I've been on the financial management side. And I'm still as uh, passionate about those roles today as I was when I started my career. So this is very much an apropos topic for me that I'm very interested to share my views with you, but also get some feedback from you in terms of your concerns because it is so important to prepare you for the next level. And as Carmen said, uh, I'm not as um, in touch now with the internal audit community, but I know several years ago we were having difficulty recruiting. I can testify that on the financial management side, those challenges exist today. So I'm hoping uh, with my 10 years plus of experience as an executive committee member, I can share with you what might have worked for me. I don't have a magic recipe, but I can certainly tell you what are some of the attributes that have worked for me as a valued contributor to the executive table, and what is my expectation when I bring people on my management team. I will say to you one thing, and I will get more in terms of the attributes, but when you move to a management position, it's no longer about your technical skills. We take that for granted. It's about the how do you do your work, how you manage your team, how you engage with your colleagues, how you engage with other outside the organization, and how you propose solutions to issues and make things better. So it's, it's a different framework, but nonetheless, your technical expertise that you're building now is very important as a foundation for you to prepare for the next level. So without further ado, I'll uh, pass uh, the microphone uh, to uh, my colleague. So, uh, alors, bonjour tout le monde, bon après-midi. Uh, merci pour l'invitation de parler avec vous aujourd'hui. Uh, je sais que la discussion aujourd'hui, c'est comment, uh, comment pour, pour, pourriez-vous renforcer vos compétences pour être membre du comité de, de leadership dans, uh, dans un ministère. Alors, je pense que premièrement, c'est essentiel d'avoir les bonnes compétences techniques. I mean, that may seem obvious, but certainly what what I look for and what my senior colleagues look for when they're looking to hire into senior positions uh, in, in audit in the CFO kind of role, obviously you need people with very good technical skill. So for anybody who likes to play cards, I would say that's kind of the table stakes. You know, mm -hmm. you don't get to get into the game unless you have the good technical competency. But really, that's kind of the baseline. That's not really, we kind of assume that when we're hiring and when we're looking for those people to join the leadership table, that you have the technical skills. That's kind of an assumption. It's the other, as Carmen said, it's the other kind of, I guess, more intangibles that are really, uh, really the signs of leadership and really the elements that, uh, that I would feel are successful, uh, that are necessary for success uh, in a controllership type, type job at the senior level. Uh, and some of those are ones that you can develop, and others that are ones that are, it's a little bit harder to tell you how you might develop them if you think there's an issue. So, for example, judgment. I mean, I can tell you that technical skills are not worth as much as having good judgment. When we're looking for people to take leadership roles, you really want to have people who uh, are, are good at decision making. They can look at a, an issue and they can, you know, they can sniff out, hmm, there's a problem here. Or, no, no, this is, this is pretty straightforward, we can go ahead. Uh, judgment, I should say, does not mean risk aversion. So good judgment doesn't mean that you never get the organization in trouble, because it's easy to be risk averse. It just means you don't actually make any decisions. Every, every decision, in effect, is to you know, kind of not, not make a decision. So that's not really exercising judgment. So there's an element of, of, of judgment, which is about, you know, when do you take risks? How do you manage the risk you take? When is it not okay to take a risk because the risks are too high or something? And the ability to sort of identify 
problem. So judgment, I think, is really important. The other thing you want at the senior management table is, in a sense, you want people who are self-starters. You want people who are action managers. Uh, it's not enough just to have the technical skill. As a leader at the, at the management table, you want people who are identifying problems and identifying opportunities and acting on them and bringing them forward where it makes sense to discuss them with the deputy or at the management table or just executing where the opportunity or the risk is something in their own domain that they can deal with. So the technical competence is great, and if you're at a staff level, you know, you're waiting for your boss to tell you what to do, then that's fine. But as a senior leader, the expectation actually is that you're the one who's taking the action. You're the one that's moving the ball ahead. So that action management, that proactiveness is really important. And the third area that I would say, frankly, is really important is having a sense of the broader context. And I can guarantee we're going to come back to this in the discussion this afternoon because I think if there's one thing that's really important for you to understand in the roles you have is that you're an enabler of the success of the organization. And this is very easy to forget, particularly in a job where you're trying to, in a sense, ensure the rules are being followed. You can start to focus on kind of enforcing the rules and not realize that the rules are there to help ensure the success of the organization and to move it forward. And so having a broader context, understanding how your function fits into the organization, understanding what the organization's mission is, what your clients are trying to accomplish, all of that is essential for you to do, for you to do your job well. Uh, and if I think of my job, I joke around a bit about it sometimes, but as a deputy minister, I actually don't do any work. I mean, in the sense that <laughs> You know, I don't have any files, right? I, you know, I don't come in and it's not my job to, in the case of Health Canada, I'm not doing a drug assessment. I'm not looking at chemicals. All of that stuff is being done by the employees that work for me. And in a sense, even my managers don't do that. They're managing. I'm managing managers who then are actually managing frontline staff. So virtually all of my work as deputy minister is about trying to identify what are the things that need moving forward? What are, what are the risks to the organization? Uh, you know, it's, you know, making decisions, you know, what, you know, what should we take to the minister? What are the things that are just housekeeping we should get done on our own? You know, what are the risks that we shouldn't be taking? You know, what are the opportunities? Uh, and it's having a sense of the broader context. So because, you know, my minister has to be able to go to cabinet and explain what we're doing to, you know, 20 or 30 other people, uh, all of whom are coming at the issue from a different perspective. So having a sense of how my ministry fits into the big picture. So, in a senior leadership role, it's all of those intangible qualities that are really important. And so there are, there are a variety of ways to develop that and cultivate that and demonstrate that and be happy to talk a bit about that uh, with you later on uh, today. Excellent. Actually, I'd like to start by talking a little bit more about competencies. Uh, we talk about uh, earning and keeping a seat at, at the management table. I think we could probably all agree that it's a question of building credibility and earning the trust of the people at that table. And what, if, if we can think a little bit more, what types of competencies do we need to achieve that? We talked about judgment, and I certainly gave you some hints in, in the title of our, of our session today. So we talked a lot about business acumen. If you don't know what you're talking about, it's probably hard to be taken seriously. And then uh, I know the IIA talks a lot about having the courage to really state your opinion. And can, can I ask uh, each of you to maybe talk a, a little bit further about some key competencies that we should think about further developing? Carm, should I start? Um, if, if I may, before I get to the competencies, I'm going to give you buckets. And the competencies, I think, fit into those. I'm not sure if they're competencies or attributes or whatever. But I think in, in reflecting, again, on what good executive presence is or leadership, um, I ended up sort of with three big buckets, for the lack of a tech better word. The first is substance. So that's in, in the substance bucket. I would put tal uh, technical talent, knowledge, business acumen, all of those things that, that come with really knowing your stuff. Uh, and that is not just audit or finance, but also knowing the business of, of the client. Uh, and the context, the risk context, and so on. So there's, a, there's an important substantial piece, a substantive piece, which we've already <coughs> talked about. The other two buckets, I think, are worth emphasizing, um, uh, if, if you'll allow me, and, and maybe, I don't know if they're provocative or not. The next one is style. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, not a competency, but it's a really important attribute that often gets short shrift in terms of talking about the executive presence. And by style, I don't mean, you know, are you fashionable? Do you have the right dress on or the right suit on? Although I think that's part of it, but it's how you show up. How you show up in that boardroom. Do you show up confidently? Do you show up 
cleanly in some <laughs> respects. I, I, I don't mean to jest, but in, there's, a, there's a grain of truth in what I'm saying. So there's a whole style or, or professionalism component that I think, uh, especially for people um, coming up, really needs to be emphasized and, and, uh, uh, because it can undermine you instantly, instantly. Um, and the last one is really probably the most important. And again, I, I'm hardly a competency, but it, there's a number of things that fit in there. And that's character. So we, we don't often talk about character because it's a, it's a personal kind of a quality. There's, and in some cases, it, it, it doesn't fit in the discourse we talk a lot about leadership. But increasingly, I'm bringing this to, to my clients and my, and my, my teams is to say, what do we mean by character? Integrity, courage, um, ability to speak truth to power. All of these things that, uh, you know, you can ask Simon, but I'm pretty sure he would say he doesn't necessarily want yes men or maybe not at all, he doesn't mm -hmm. want yes men or yes women at the table. You have to have that backbone, that ability to stand up and say, when something is right, it's right, when it's wrong, it's wrong, and have that, have that kind of character and strength of, uh, to me, is an intimate part of leadership, and it's one that I, I think, I fear, doesn't get enough attention. And the, the last thing I will say before passing over the microphone that I think is so critical, and I, it doesn't really fit in any of those three areas, and I'm not entirely sure how you develop it, but it's, in my mind, grace under pressure. So it's probably mostly in the character side of things, but your ability to, when faced with an, no offense, Simon, an angry deputy or a worried client or, uh, or wrongdoing or something, that, or your own mistakes, because we make mistakes, your ability to stand up, you know, take, take, the, uh, take the tough shots, and, and in some cases defend yourself. And again, the, a tough one to do, except the only way you can develop that, I think, as individuals is by doing, is the experiential. It's what we try to teach our kids. I've got three kids and I'm trying to teach it all the time to them. Grit, resilience, your ability to sort of stand up. We can't helicopter, we shouldn't be helicopter parenting our kids and we shouldn't be helicopter managing our staff or ourselves. We, sometimes we have to fail to learn those kinds of skills, to learn how it feels to fall and, to, and to, to, to be embarrassed or whatever, but that's the kind of grace under pressure that well, I know when I see it, whether it's on my board or in my clients um, or my, my colleagues that I work with, when, if you have that, uh, that is absolutely critical, and if you don't, you have to develop it. It's absolutely vital for this role. Liette, côté finance, est-ce que tu vois les mêmes choses ou certaines distinctions? C'est certainement que les points que je vais faire, même si mes buckets sont peut-être un peu différents de ceux de Carmen, il y a beaucoup de points qui vont se rejoindre. I'll speak to it perhaps more in terms of a role as a chief audit executive and as a role of a CFO, because this is, uh, those are the roles I've played at the executive table. Uh, what were some of the things that worked for me? Um, and I go back to uh, what uh, Simon said. So I have my first bucket, do your homework. Do your homework to enable you to provide valued advice at the table. So do your homework, know your job, do your job, own your job, report on your job. But I will say in terms of corporate services type of function, get to know the business of your department and agency. I have stressed that uh, through my engagement with my internal auditors and my financial officers. Oftentimes, people think finance is finance, whether I'm in PCO, whether I'm in health, whether I am in corrections, it's all the same. The rules are the same, but the context in which we operate are different. So how does that impact the work that you do for the organization you're in? So investing time in knowing your organization, asking the question, there's no stupid question. Be brave, ask the question. I mean use the right forum to ask the question, uh, ask the question, learn from them, validate your understanding, and you will be a more valued player at the table. I'll give you a simple uh, example. When my in internal auditors, for example, would go and do a visit to one of our feder federal penitentiary, I would say, you're doing an audit, but before you go, the day that you're going to enter and have a discussion with the warden, Take the time to review what's in the newspaper. Does that impact that organization? Do we know of something that happened in that institution? So you're more attuned to what's going on and ask questions about their operation. Even though it may not be within the scope of your audit, 
you will learn from it. Same thing on the financial side. We're good at putting numbers together, spreadsheet and all of that. Our role is to do more than that. It's to tell the story around the numbers. You can't tell the story around the numbers if you don't fully appreciate how the business works. So myself, I invest a lot of time in understanding the business. I've been at Corrections for nine years and every day I'm learning, including sometimes reading stuff in the newspaper. I said I should have known that before it hit the newspaper. So it's a continuous journey, one we have to invest, but one that is so, so important. And I will say if you do that, your colleagues will respect you because they will understand that you have done your homework, you have an informed decision, and you've done your due diligence in the context of the information that's available to you. The second uh, bucket, uh, and I, it, for me it's kind of a, a bucket that could be wider, but I call it fairness, and fairness in the broad sense. Um, I'm being called the money lady where I work. Mm -hmm. So if you're the money lady, you may have a lot of people that want to be your friend uh, or it's not. Better, better than the bag uh, lady. But I will say, and even as the chief audit executive, you kind of play a stewardship role at the table, but you're also a strategic advisor. And if you're the money lady, it means you have a certain control, other than the DM, of course, <laughs> on, on, on the resource allocation to the organization. And we know we need money to get the results done. So it's so, so important and it is still for me that I'm being perceived, not only am I unbiased and objective, but I'm also being perceived that way. So how do I do that? Again, I explain what my expectations are. I'm transparent. It's clear for people when we have a discussion what they can do and what they cannot do, but perhaps if we do it this way, we'll achieve what we want. And it's again, is you treat people fairly, consistently, openly. And I would say it has worked well for me and it has made my job of saying no very often because in the role we are, we have to say no. We like to say yes when things work. And it's equally important when it's a no, it's a no and people know that you've done your due diligence and you've worked with them to find something. The third bucket has a number of things attached to it, but for me, they all resonate the same way. Listen, engage, be accessible, and be committed to resolving issues, finding solution. Again, it's sometimes easy for us to say, okay, this is not a money issue, this is a program issue. Or the rest of the organization will say, we don't have enough money, this is a CFO issue. No, no, this is a collective issue that we have to work with together. And for me, when I was a CAE, I would be doing an audit, I would present it to uh, the uh, ADM responsible for the program, sometimes we'd have good discussion, sometimes we missed a target in understanding the risk of non-compliance. And it was very important for me to capture that because I could only give a good recommendation if I only could understand what's the so what. So again, listen, engage, be accessible, people want to talk to you, they want to have a discussion with you. Don't hide behind, I'm independent, I can't talk to you about this in case I come back three years down the road to audit or to provide financial advice. Don't hide behind that. Know what your territory is and know what you know in terms of information and advice you can provide. And again, uh, for me, Oftentimes, again, because we are stewardship in those functions, yeah, we have to say no. But the framework I like to use it is not what can't be done, is how can we do something within the context that we have to operate. And I will say there are many rules out there and we have to comply with them, but sometimes you have to look at how can this be in our context. And I'll, again, just give you a simple, salute, a simple example. One of my first audit when I arrived at the corrections was an audit of fire safety. So we have labor code in Canada that dictates how you're supposed to do fire safety drills and you're supposed to comply with that. Okay, fire safety drill, once a year you're supposed to evacuate the building and that's how it should be done. Oh, I go do my audit and I'm in a maximum penitentiary, penitentiary institution. You just don't push the button and let them out at the same time. Doesn't work that way. So again, you learn to adapt what was the spirit, the principle there 
to the organization you're working with. And I use that example because for me, I can say I was embarrassed at the end of the day had, that I had not picked it up. And my excuse was I was relatively new at corrections at that time. But you learn from those things. How do those apply to the environment in, you're in? And work with your colleagues, peer, uh, central agencies, when you see there's a problem for which there doesn't seem to be a solution, there is always a solution. Just work through with those that are around you. And at the end of the day, if it's a no, there's no way you're going to break the law. Have the courage to basically say it affirmatively and have the right evidence there with you. So for me, those are three ways of character. I would probably put them in all your buckets that I continue uh, to work on because Every day you have to put another ingredient in the bucket to make it more effectively. But so far, it's been something that has worked well for me to gain the trust and the respect of my colleagues at the executive table. Merci. Simon, vous avez déjà partagé certaines compétences yeah. clés avec nous. Do you have additional buckets too? Or do um, we want to maybe get into further uh, description? Well, um, so I think uh, Carmen and Liette provided a good overview of, the, of, the, of, the, of, uh, of some of those issues. Um, I think what I would add, I think one of the things that differentiates a lot of the work you do from some of the other functions in an organization is, and this is just a personal view, but you know, you are first and foremost in many respects in the trust business, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not actually really spending the money. You're, 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 you're showing management and you're helping to assure that you know, the money is being spent in the way Parliament intended it to be spent and that you know, the budget isn't blown and that it's not, you know, things aren't happening inappropriately. And it's the same thing for audit and evaluation. I mean, in a sense, you're not actually doing the work, you're auditing to ensure that. And so, and so it's really important, uh, the trust element of what you do is really important. And I would say a lot, of the, a lot of the competencies and a lot of the behaviors and a lot of the things that you need to think about as a professional in this area flow from that. So, for example, I think you know being forthright and being upfront about in your advice uh, is really important because the strategy of telling the deputy minister or telling management what they want to hear is great for a little while because you know everyone's really happy to hear what they want to hear until it's revealed that actually what you've been saying is actually not true or you know was sugar coated. And once that's happened, you've lost trust. And being in the trust business, once you've lost trust, I tell you, it's very hard to get it back. Uh, and also, it's not just a matter of building trust with the deputy minister or, or, you, know, or the, 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 you know, the one or two people that might be in charge of the institution. But in order for you to do your job well, you have to build trust relationships with all the other managers because you're in the business of you know, going and checking out the work they're doing. And, and you, frankly, are going to rely on getting information from them in order to do your job properly. And I would say when we're discussing the, the numbers, you know, the quarterly reports or, the, or the, you know, uh, the, uh, the monthly financial status reports at the senior management table, or we're discussing audit reports, you know, all of the assistant deputy ministers, all the senior members of the table are there. And if there's a real problem with the findings or the real problem with the numbers, that's going to emerge very quickly. And so it's not necessarily that you want to make every one of the management team sort of, you know, your best friend necessarily, but, you know, you need to build really good trust relationships mm -hmm. with, the, with, with the management team and with, you know, and with other areas of the department in order to do, do your job effectively. The trust relationship works in both ways. The deputy minister and others need to trust that what you're giving them is true. I do not have technical competence, for example, in accounting or financial management. I mean, I know how to read a cash flow statement and a P&L and so on, but I, that is not my confidence. I have to rely that what I'm getting is accurate. And if I don't have trust in the CFO, that's a big problem. But for the CFO to do their job well and to, you know, be able to provide assurance to me, they have to have the trust in the management team because they have to be able to go to the management team and have those honest discussions and so on. So, you know, when you look at the kinds of competencies that are needed, I think managing human relations and building partnerships, you know, actually uh, collaborating with a wide variety of people, that's essential. If you are in the business of audit, evaluation, or, you know, financial uh, con controllership, you absolutely need to be able to manage relationships and build good relationships if 
if you're going to do your job well. Uh, you know, if you look at the various uh, competencies for senior executives, for ADMs, that's in there. Can't do your job in modern, modern governance without working with a lot of different people. No one works in a little silo. Uh, the whole issue of values and ethics and upholding values and ethics is really critical. And it's, it's, it's not just a matter of, our, you know, are the books being cooked or, or whatever. It's actually, it, it's, it's an issue of can I rely that when there is a problem, people are going to come and tell me, mm -hmm. even if it might make them uncomfortable or even if, you know, they, they, they reviewed the books, they thought everything was fine, and then later on they find a problem to have, to have the integrity be able to come and say, we've made a mistake, there's an issue. Because again, maintaining trust means when something goes wrong, people tell you about it. And, they, and they, they're honest about it and they're able, to, they're able to, to fix it. Or when there's something that maybe they know management doesn't want to hear, they tell management. They might find an elegant way to do it. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, you know, that, that, you, know, that uh, you, you run off and you know, be a gadfly and be difficult. But you know, part of building trust is management has to know that they're getting the straight goods from you. And, and the management team has to feel that even though you're in the job of assurance, and that sometimes you know, you're going to have things to say that maybe you know, put their programs or their policies in a bad light, that you have their interests at heart. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, they're not going to work with you. Yeah. So I think you know, a lot of your work, you have to think about, uh, it, it, you know, and I'm, I'm, I guess we're going to come to this later, but it's, you're, you're in a kind of a complicated place because your job is to forthrightly and honestly provide a picture of what's going on in the organization. But with the objective of not calling people out and not, you know, gotcha, haha, mm -hmm. but with the objective of actually helping the organization yeah. achieve its goals. So, you know, and that's a delicate balance. And, and so you need to find ways to point out issues and difficulties but without alienating the people that you're, you, whose difficulties you're pointing out. So I think having a really good understanding of your mission in the organization, what you're there for, you're there to help, even if it means you're playing this controllership function, and having a sensitivity to relationships and managing those relationships well and having the courage and the fortitude to you know be able to speak truth to power and you know and be able to admit when maybe even in your own organization there's been a mistake all of that is absolutely critical because you know I'm very fortunate in my institution you know hopefully they're not watching <laughs> but I mean I trust my CFO and I, you know and I trust my my head of audit and evaluation and I would be very nervous if I didn't because, you know, if I blow the vote, that's a big problem. If we have programs that are going way over budget or whether there are real issues around, around, uh, around financial controls or, or, or kind of the spending of money that's been appropriated by Parliament, that's a, big, that's a big problem. So I need to know, you know, in some ways more than maybe even some other members of the management team that those functions are working properly. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, that would be the only observation I would make. Just think about that in a little bit, that you're in the trust game, and what does that mean for the work you do? I'd like to talk a little bit more about that balance, and, and maybe it's more so on the internal audit than the finance side, but this balance of being independent, yet providing being a good corporate player at the management table. Uh, we've actually heard <coughs> deputies and even some CAE, new CAEs saying, well, you know, I, I can't get too involved at the management table because I have to remain independent. So it begs the question, can you be both successfully? And, and is it actually an issue? Liette, have, have you seen or, or heard of this uh, dilemma with the issue of balance before? And has it affected you before? For me, I can say that it hasn't been an issue. Are there times where you say, is it really my role right now to play on this file or should I wait? Yeah, there has been that. But um, for me, you're there, as Simon says, to help the organization. You've been chosen to be an executive because of your technical competency, your leadership competency, and your knowledge and experience as an individual. So you have a contribution to bring to the table. And I haven't felt as a chief audit executive sitting at the executive committee that I could not make representation on my views in the event that I would audit later. Absolutely not. I would have felt the opposite. If they're putting a policy in front of me and I believe it's not clear and I say nothing and then I audit the next year and I go in the field and they say, boy, that policy wasn't clear. And I'm thinking I would have missed my opportunity to make a positive contribution to the table. So no, I have not. 
And I know when I was in the chief audit executive community, there was a lot of, oh, let's not do this, especially on the internal control side. Let's not work too closely with the financial community in case we come back later. No, 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 we're working together for the organization to improve internal controls, to implement the policy. How can we do that given our respective responsibility in the fr framework we have to operate? And for us at the Corrections, it's been a good partnership and hopefully it will continue to be that way. But to say that I have faced that personally, no, because I don't see it. You know, for me, it's, it's your objectivity is one in terms of how you apply your judgment. That's where for me it's very important. Mm -hmm. But this balancing thing, I keep that for my yoga and Pilates class. <laughs> <laughs> Car Carmen, you uh, co-authored a paper not that long ago, uh, and I think this this specific issue was raised before. So, what have you heard, and what are some of the concerns from IIA's perspective? Yeah, I'll give you both perspectives and my personal opinion thrown in as well. Um, we have heard that this is, um, and you used it earlier, Liet, um, people hiding behind the independence. Uh, I see it all the time. I've heard uh, when I did the research study, which uh, Jennifer was speaking about, we interviewed deputy ministers and chief audit executives, and I heard that theme over and over. Yes, we know we want to be a trusted business advisor, but we're independent. And the question you posed in the beginning is actually uh, further, in some ways, reinforces that. What I would say is a myth. It, uh, my argument would be this. Your independence is your best asset. Um, they are not in conflict. It is, it is not indeed, and I think that's, we, there's a big fallacy around what assurance is versus what trusted advisor, um, strategic advisor kind of work is. Uh, and typically we would say assurance is the stuff that we do on our own, it takes a lot longer to do, and it's different than the advice we give. And, and to me that is a huge fallacy. What we should be looking at is our assurance work should be giving advice. The two are very, very similar. They're very, it's just, again, a bit of a mind, a mind switch that you have. Um, so I think that, that is the, the advice I would give, number one, is don't look at independence and your ability to provide advice as being mutually exclusive. In fact, do absolutely the opposite. Think of them as mutually reinforcing. You do, we know from the IIA's perspective, you have absolute authority under the professional standards to do consulting and advisory services, and, and yes, there are gray zones. It's not always easy to strike the right balance between, you know, because you do not want to be going in and designing the controls. But as Liette said, and I had exactly the same example in my mind, if I'm asked by the deputy minister or, who, or somebody else to give advice because I'm qualified to give the advice on a particular control or a program, and I opt to say, no, I can't because one day I might come back, um, I have to say the only word that comes to my mind is absurd. Now, if, if he was asking me or she was asking me, can you go and design a program, Carmen, uh, that would be a bit of a different story. But if asked, what do you think of this program design or what do you think of this initiative or this policy, for me to, for me to answer, sorry, Simon, not my bailiwick, I might have to come back and I'm going to wait for your managers to do it and then I'm going to come back and judge them on it. Uh, it, as again, is, is an absurd proposition. So I think we have to sort of stop hiding behind that, that notion. I, one of the things we did find in the research, and I thought it was a really interesting finding, is that um, what we think, anyway, one of the reasons that people are uh, chief audit executives or auditors are hiding is because it's a bit scary going into that gray zone. We are by nature evidence-based people. There's a great amount of comfort that comes with having a working paper binder, we don't do binders anymore, but anyway, that, that this thick, because ah, we know all the answers black and white. When we're asked for advice, uh, even if we give it independently, we're taking risk. We may not know the answer, so, you know, d d deputy, we might, you know, so we have to be uh, a little bit personally comfortable with going into that gray zone, that mix, um, uh, with the potential that we might not have all the answers. And if we're, if we're not comfortable with that, we see a lot of people saying, I'm not comfortable, therefore I'm not going there. And that is, I will say to you and to those uh, people watching on the web, is a big strategic mistake for your future ability as a leader. You are missing huge opportunities if asked uh, to, to play a very strategic role. And I would again maybe just wrap up by reiterating your ability to add that strategic value is not just in getting into the mix and doing that, but it's the independence that you bring to that question you're being asked. So uh, to me, they're not at all mutually exclusive.
Excellent. Simon, is, is this something that deputies are worried about? Is there? Um, well, I mean, I, just a couple of impressions. Uh, you know, one is, you know, I, this may be a bit of a debate that goes on in your community, but this, this issue is not unique uh, by any stretch to your community. I mean, truthfully, almost every member of the management team can make, if they wanted to, could lay some claim to independence. I mean, if you're the assistant deputy minister of human resources or the director general of HR or something, I mean, there are all manner of rules and requirements that have to be respected from the office of the chief human resources officer, the public service commission, the treasury board secretariat. Uh, you know, if you're, uh, if you're the, uh, uh, you know, you're the, you know, the head of communications. I mean, there are communications policies promulgated by both Treasury Board and PCO. Uh, I mean, as Deputy Minister, I have, I have a dual accountability. It's built right into our system mm -hmm. of government. I'm appointed yeah. by the Cabinet on the recommendation of the Prime Minister, and yet I'm appointed to serve a minister. So there are, there are occasions when, you know, frankly, uh, you know, I might uh, have to be, you know, exercising my duty to the Cabinet system and the Prime Minister and, you know, well, unfortunately, it hasn't happened recently, but you know, there, there, there's certainly you can see kind of textbook examples yeah. where that might yeah. come in conflict to the duty of loyalty to a minister. So, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure none of you think this way, but if anyone sort of has this precious idea that this independence issue is unique to this community, mm -hmm. it's not. Uh, and, and, and there are many different executives in, in the large government ministry that could make similar claims. Uh, you know, I think what I would say is that uh, certainly my view is that. Uh, the, 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 the folks who play the controllership function in a department are part of the management team and like other members of the management team have on occasion times when their duty calls for them to exercise some sort of independent role where they really have an advice function that might be a little bit separate from you know from a lot of their day-to-day -day responsibilities as a member of the management team but as I've noted that's not necessarily unique to the CFO or the audit function and you know from a governance perspective the chief audit executive or the, or the CFO is not, is not an, a, an external sh assurance provider. Like, they actually are a member of the department and they are a member of the management team. You know, if you take a large corporation, for example, the CFO is a member of the management team. I mean, there's no one disputes this. So is the head of internal audit. And, you know, and they sit at the management table and indeed in large companies, often the CFO is, is next in line to be C the CEO when the CEO yeah. retires. You know, that's different than if you're, you know, PW or you're Deloitte or something and you are an external organization that is hired by the firm to take a second look. And I think in those circumstances, you know, you, you wouldn't want to have, you know, the external organization somehow have be in a conflict by both, you know, doing work and auditing the same work. I think everybody recognizes that. But that's not really what we're talking about here. The other thing I would say is, and, and again, just to, to urge you not to think of yourselves in that sort of, while well, I'm independent, you know, I can't possibly get my hands dirty. I think there's danger in that kind of attitude, actually, because coming back to what we discussed earlier, a really big part of the function that you play is to, is, is to be, you know, to be honest to the management team about the problems you find, but it's all in the service of helping you know, advance the business of the organization. And so, as a member of the management team, there is this, you know, really important function that can be played to be helpful, to contribute to program design, to kind of be a contributor at the management table. And if you conceive of yourself as being, you know, this is really inappropriate because I'm, you know, I'm above all this and I have to be independent, then you're actually not making the contribution that's expected of you. The value that you can potentially bring is not being brought to the table. And I think the risk, in a way, is it can cultivate a, a sense that, um, that you don't have a stake in the success of the things that you're auditing and the success of the, of, of, of the beans, you know, in a sense that you're counting. There is an expression I'm sure many of you have heard in corporate governance, you know, that the role of a board of directors is it's nose in, fingers out. And the idea is that, you know, part of the board's job is to kind of sniff around, you know, make sure there's no problems and so on, but not to get their hands in and be telling the organization what to do and kind of, you know, second guessing management's decisions. There's a real risk sometimes, and it's even recognized in broader corporate governance, that when, when you have this assurance role, you know, you, you can find yourself in a position of wanting to second guess management and kind of substituting your judgment for management. And so I think there's actually a certain value in being a participant, yeah. mm -hmm. not, not to corrupt yourself and now you're being asked to give assurance on things that you actually help design, but because, you know, frankly, It'll, it'll make you more effective in, in the job as opposed to just kind of standing back and judging. So I, I, and I really, and, and again, 
it's the sort of, this is the same sort of advice I would give any member of the management team. I have important independent roles that I have to play in the organization, but you know, I'm, I'm, I, but I, but I recognize that I'm actually a part of the organization, and I, you know, and I have these dual loyalties. It's not always comfortable, but I think if you can live with it, it's more effective than sort of trying to compartmentalize everything and just pretend that you have no stake uh, in in what it is you're looking at, you know, what you're auditing or or what you're doing. Well, that settles it. <laughs> no more hiding behind independence. <laughs> That's pretty straightforward. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, we're uh, close to opening up for questions, so start thinking uh, of, of things you'd like to ask of our panel, uh, people watching us on, on the web as well. Uh, you were given email addresses, so feel free to send them in and we'll, we'll get to you shortly. Uh, maybe one last question. Uh, you have aspiring uh, CAE, CFOs, or senior leaders. Um, are there any barriers to people earning that seat at the management table? And it might, again, still be more an issue on, on the internal audit side because, believe it or not, there are still some CAEs that are not at the management mm -hmm. table. Uh, but are there any impediments or, or barrier? And if so, what can future leaders start doing now to prevent them going forward? Maybe I can start with Carmen. Yeah. I think that the easy answer, um, but not my only answer, is to say the inverse of what we started talking about at the beginning. So developing those competencies and those uh, those attributes. Um, in addition, I, I, in reflecting on this question, I, I would say I think on the inter internal audit side, certainly, some of the impediments or barriers, I think um, perhaps frustratingly, are actually rooted in the nature of our profession and what that brings out in us uh, and what uh, what that in some cases attracts us to the profession. And by that I mean um, the nature of the profession, as, as Simon has said, is by definition we're in the business, we are in the business of trust, but we judge every day. So here, by show of hands, who here likes to be judged? Yeah, no hands are up. Uh, I certainly don't like it, my kids don't like it, my clients don't like it. Um, and, I, and I'm being a little bit cute about it, but because our business, and it is, I'm not saying that shouldn't be our business, that is our business, but what we often see as a, these are very personal impediments, personal barriers that I think individuals have to overcome, is when we're in that business and we're in it for a long time, one thing sometimes happens. We kind of get arrogant. We kind of get a little bit on our high horse. We second guess management sometimes, if we're not careful. Um, and so I think the biggest barrier in some respects is our reaction or our view of our own selves uh, from a per very, very personal perspective in terms of our roles. We may not be, and we probably are not, the smartest person in the room when we're dealing with senior management on these very complicated issues. So to go in, and, and again, I, I think it's, it's not an in, often not an intentional thing that occurs, but it's simply because of the nature of the business we in some, we're in, sometimes we we kind of let ourselves slide to say we're, there's a self-righteousness sometimes that comes with our mandate and we have to be so careful to, to check that because uh, in as much as you might be the right smartest person in the room, you're not going to get anywhere if you come in guns a-blazing um, to, to the management table saying I know more than you and you guys are all wrong and you know foolishly, you will instantly lose credibility. You will. Uh, certainly not be able to gain trust. That's a, a killer for trust. So I think it's the biggest impediment I might say is just watch yourself. Check your behaviors, your reactions. And, and there's a, so I don't want you, by the same token, to think we should all be going in, uh, you know, hat in hand and, you know, um, uh, apologetic to be coming and doing. We have a legitimate mandate. We have to be confident and, 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 uh, and strong and affirmative in that mandate. But you also don't want to come in um, the opposite end of the spectrum, guns a-blazing. So there's a, some measure of humility uh, that goes in equal measure with your, your confidence and your, your, uh, your substance and that style that I was talking about at the beginning. Yeah. So I'll approach it from a slightly uh, different perspective, and I fully support what Carmen said. So are there barriers? That, there's always barriers to anything you want to do is how you approach them. From my perspective, if I look at uh, the job of the CAE and the CFO and the fact that we are in the trust business and we're very much evidence-based. So what I see as a challenge, and I certainly felt it when I moved from the chief audit executive to the CFO, is how much information is enough before I can make a decision. And I say that as a challenge today because of the ease of getting so much information on so many subjects so quickly. 
So do I have enough? Have I consulted on this? Did I look at what they were saying on GC Connects? Did I, you know, tap into the research that was done on this so I can make an informed decision? And I will tell you the biggest challenge for me was when I moved from the chief audit executive to the CFO was my ability to make an informed decision I was comfortable with, with perhaps a lot less evidence that I had when I was a chief audit executive. I would start an audit, I would have a few months, I would get the report. When you're the CFO, you don't have that luxury of time. When you do a costing attestation on a memorandum to cabinet that's thick and there's been versions of it coming your way, you have to be able to feel comfortable that you can make the decision with the information that's in front of you. And I find that to be an increasing challenge for me because of what's out there. Not one that we cannot manage, but it is one for me that I feel we have to continue to equip our staff to say, okay, you may not have it all, focus on the key things, and what you don't have, also be truthful about what you know and what you don't know. So when you make that advice to senior management, they know what zone you're playing in. But again, it is for me something that will continue to challenge us as a community. And it's not only us, it would be in the program areas, it's all, all those that need to do analysis. How much is enough? Simon. Uh, OK. Alors, je pense qu'il y a des barrières qui existent dans toutes sortes de professions. Il n'y a pas des barrières uniques dans votre profession. Et dans un certain sens, je pense que les barrières sont semblables, profession à profession. Et quand j'ai commencé, euh, on a commencé les discussions, j'ai parlé un peu de ma perspective sur les compétences. C'est important d'avoir le jugement, c'est important d'être euh, un gestionnaire qui, euh, qui lance en action quand c'est nécessaire, et c'est important d'avoir un sens de perspective. You know, senior, senior managers, um, you know, deputy managers and others are looking, when they're looking for people to promote, when they're looking for managers to promote, you know, you need to have those basic skills, and you all have those basic skills, so that's not the barrier. You know, if you don't have your CA or, you know, you don't need to do accounting in school, that's a pretty big barrier if you want to have a senior job in controllership. So I'm assuming everyone has that, you know, education. Those aren't the barriers that are important. The important barriers when senior managers are looking to hire are, you know, does this person have good judgment? Do they have a, a broad perspective? You know, can, do they get things done and all that sort of stuff? And so, you know, what are the barriers to developing those skills? And frankly, what are the barriers to having to getting some visibility so people mm -hmm. can actually see that you have those yeah. skills? And so, you know, the kind of advice that, uh, that I would give to a group such as yourself is if, if this is the profession you love and this is what you want to do, I wouldn't discourage you from pursuing it, but you should think about as you advance your career, having opportunities to step outside mm -hmm. of that profession from Great. time to time. Mm -hmm. and there's a variety of reasons for that. So reason number one is, you know, um, there's always the risk if you stay in your narrow swim lane your entire career that you miss opportunities to broaden your network and to broaden your horizon. And when you broaden your network, you meet more people and, you know, your opportunities increase. Number two, Increasingly, senior leaders are looking for people with broader experience to put into senior roles. If you look at the deputy minister table, for example, if you go back, you know, maybe 50 or 60 years ago, there was probably much more of a trend that, and you see this in the corporate sector as well, that, you know, someone started in the mailroom and then they made it all the way to be CEO. And now, increasingly, when you're looking for people in senior leadership positions, you're looking for people who have some international experience, you know, if it's in banking, they might have been in retail, and then they were investment banking. Like you want, these are large, complicated organizations. You want people who have actually done a number of different jobs. And it's no different in the public service. You know, most of my colleagues at the deputy table have served in, you know, several departments. They might have worked in a central agency. It's relatively rare that someone goes up through one department, has never been outside that department, and makes it to the top job. And it's very similar in your profession. You can learn more about what it's like from your client's perspective. You can help build your network. And you will have a much more well-rounded CV. And, 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 and the deputy minister and others will say, wow, that person's got a bit of a broader rounding. You know, they clearly can think broader, et cetera. So I think that's an advantage. Uh, the second thing I would say, and, and this applies really to anybody, not just folks in, in your kind of situation, but uh, you know, doing a good job is great. Uh, you know, developing that broader perspective is, is really good. 
But at the end of the day, you know, you also have to have the opportunities present themselves to you. And some of that's a matter of hard work and some of that's a matter of luck. And I am a, a believer that you can increase, you know, your, your odds. You can kind of raw, you know, raise your luck quotient. Uh, and there are a variety of ways to do that. So one is, you know, you should, you should um, uh, be selective about who you go to work for. So when the phone rings offering a promotion, don't just take it right there, at, you know, right on the spot. If you're good and you do a good job and you have a good reputation, the phone will ring again. It's not going to ring just once. So this is not your only shot at a promotion. But you really want to think about who you work for because really good managers have a good reputation and they eventually get snapped up and, you know, and they move around. Uh, and, they, and good managers have a, have, a, have a reputation for hiring good people. So even if nobody knows you, if they know your boss and they think your boss is really great, then chances are some of that will rub off to you. And if you're working for someone really great, they're going to be mobile and they're going to have opportunity. And that actually increases your opportunity. The second thing is you need to think about the kind of role you're in. Are you in a role where you're not just doing a good job, but actually other people are actually going to have an opportunity to see that you're doing a good job? And so again, part of that comes back to your supervisor. If you have a supervisor who perhaps doesn't give you opportunities to shine, that's going to reduce your ability to get some exposure. Not every job is a, you know, a glamorous job where you're seeing the minister every week and so on. So depending on the kind of role you have, you might need to actually be a bit more proactive to get some exposure. So I would say if you're in a role where you, you know, you're working perhaps more solitary and so on, you know, you should join a corporate initiative, you know, uh, take part in Blueprint 2020 type measures, those sorts of things. Uh, again, you know, doing your, your day job and doing it well is key. You don't want to spend all of your time, you know, participating in networking. But if you're in a role where you don't get much exposure, you really have to think strategically about how do I actually get a little bit more chance to be seen. I actually think uh, the, the main barriers perhaps, uh, you know, in, particularly in your profession, uh, you know, I, I typically in controllership type, you know, jobs, I, I see, you know, I see the senior people or maybe one level down. I don't tend to see the more mm -hmm. junior staff, uh, whereas in perhaps another area of the department, whether it's a specialized regulatory area or maybe policy, I actually see the file officer because mm -hmm. You know, if it's, if, it's, if it's a particular file, the file officer might have to come up and explain it all. And that's less true, I think, mm -hmm. when it comes to the controllership jobs. That's my impression. It may not be true. But if you're in a role where you're not routinely seeing senior management getting exposure, then you might want to think about how, what are, how are some ways that I can, you know, have an opportunity to broaden my network a bit. Because, it, you know, you can be really fantastic, and that's half the equation. The other half of the equation is somebody has to see that you're fantastic. So you need, a, you need a supervisor that's willing to promote you and not just kind of hold on to you tight and kind of never let you go, but you know, actually can see your value and, and give you opportunity. You need to be able to be seen so other people can see you. I think there's a lot you can do in the way in which you manage your career to remove some of those barriers. So I'm, that wasn't so much about controllership and sort of, you know, but it, it's maybe a more practical, you know, uh, what are some of the things you can do to, to deal with the obvious barriers, which is getting known and et de des opportunités sent your way. Mm -hmm. Excellent conseil. C'est d'ailleurs euh, un des principes directeurs de notre stratégie de la gestion des talents. Chacun doit prendre responsabilité personnelle. Il ne faut pas attendre que les promotions nous tombent sur la tête. Il faut aller faire ce qu'on a à faire aussi. Donc, merci pour vos commentaires. Je vous invite maintenant. J'espère que vous avez le temps de songer à des bonnes questions. On, on a la chance d'avoir trois personnes euh, seniors with you who are ready to answer your questions. So, uh, uh, to facilitate the uh, hearing for the people on the web, I would ask you if you have a question to come, please use the mic in the middle. And if we have questions online too, I have my two ladies over there. Don't be shy. Hello, I'm uh, Ismar Fedzik from Industry Canada. This is a question that I actually asked at a finance conference uh, in our department last year, so I wanted to get your opinion on it. I've noticed that a lot of uh, senior advisor level employees, at least where I work, some of the best people are very hesitant to sort of move up uh, at a sort of risk of losing work-life balance. Mm. Uh, and so what I find is sometimes the very, very best people end up staying at that EX minus two, EX minus one level, and there are <coughs> sometimes others that end up taking that uh, opportunity instead. So I'm wondering if you have any uh, thoughts or comments on that. Reaction. Uh, 
I think this is a challenge that we're facing uh, in all organizations. Um, listen, I love my job and I can talk about it and I can excite people to take uh, those more senior jobs. Uh, and clearly, a balance of any, for individual, it, it's very much your own. Huh? There is no doubt, as you go up in the organization, there's increasing demand on you from the organization. And uh, for me, uh, is to be able to share your experience with your staff. So that's how I do it. I share my experience with uh, the management team. We have people on talent management, and I, I welcome them to be open about their fear to take that EX job. Was it, what was it for you? What were some of the challenges? So clearly, it is something that we're, we're seeing. Uh, I've done a number of EX processes recently, and there hasn't been as many applicants, and people will tell you that. And even through the public service employee survey, we drill down further within our own sector, and I ha I'm responsible to, for 250 people, and some are very qualified, they just don't want to go there. So for me, I encourage them to talk about their fear, what are their concerns, and equip them with what they need to be successful. Because we're aging, and we need them to just take on those new opportunities. And I believe there's a lot of talent out there and we need to champion it to the best of our ability. I might add a little bit to that. Um, with slightly different perspective, I agree. I see it as well. I have a lot of colleagues and a lot of clients uh, from my own practice that are reluctant. So it, it, it is a real issue. I, I wonder if one of the reasons that they are fearful is because in some respects, they may not feel equipped to deal with, the, I think, one of the biggest, single biggest um, um, mechanisms to manage work-life balance, and that's delegation. So I think what we, I see this a lot, people that are promoted, and it's sort of, um, uh, with, with all due respect to, to them, uh, in any organization, any profession, we tend to get promoted for our technical skills. We don't necessarily develop these other skills we've been talking about today, and we don't often develop this comfort with letting go Right, we still, you see, I see a lot of people in the EX2, EX3, even EX4 level that are still really, really smart policy analysts and, and or auditors or finance folks. And so I think what we, um, it is very certain that your work-life balance is your own. Individuals have to make that decision themselves. But I also would encourage you as you, if you're feeling that, if others are feeling that fear, is to, confront it and yes you might decide that it's not for you at the moment if you have young kids or young family or, or whatnot but also bear in mind that there is a lot you can do to control that that risk of, of imbalance and and part of it is that we have to learn those muscles of saying I've got smart people working for me I'm gonna let them do their job rather than then coming in and saying no 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 if I don't if I don't have a finger in every pot uh, the, the sky is gonna fall in no let let your your senior folks manage that so, so I would, uh, I would in encourage you to think about developing those sorts of skills as well, because I think it will make your life uh, a lot easier when you get to that level. Well, I think there's no question that um, as you take on increasing responsibility, the pressures rise. And so I think, you know, if, if anyone were to say differently, I don't, I don't think they would be, they're being completely forthright about it. Um, but I do think that it's not, uh, the issue of work-life balance is not maybe as, as kind of monolithic or as simplistic maybe as, as some people might present it or as the way people might think about it. My personal experience has been uh, this is a very personal issue and it really has to do with what your own comfort level is in your own situation. And if you're in a relationship or you, know, you, have, a, you, know, you have a family and children and so on, uh, it has to do with, with what works for your family and what kind of bargain you know, you, you, you've struck with your spouse and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very personal thing. Uh, in, you know, in my case, uh, just to give you a sense of the, of the dimensions of it, um, I would say that, uh, that, you know, it was harder when my kids were really young. The work-life balance bit was a lot harder when I had, you know, when I had a one-year-olds, you know, and two-year-olds kind of who needed to basically be monitored you know, the entire waking day than it is now when I have, you know, teenagers. And so, uh, you know, with my spouse, it's a lot easier to, to, to manage the pressures at home because, you know, we don't have little children that need to be, you know, taken care of 24 hours a day. There's no, there's no debate about, you know, who, who goes to a daycare or any of that kind of stuff. Um, that's a much bigger issue if you have really young children. So, 
you know, the work-life balance is not a static thing. It can, it can change really dramatically depending on where you are in, in, in your life. The other thing, too, which I think maybe comes as a surprise to some people is, and I, you know, I have had very promising uh, staff who I thought would be really great to go to the executive ranks and was encouraging in that, in that direction and, and maybe had reservations about it. Uh, but what I would say as well is that I think, you know, there are some stereotypes, and, and again, I'm not sure that the work-life balance equation is quite as simple as some people would have it. So to give you an, another example, uh, I would say that the hardest, the, har the hardest times for me in terms of striking work-life balance were actually as a director general. We weren't as a deputy minister. It certainly wasn't as a director. I, for me, at any rate, uh, it was sort of in that you know, mid to upper level because I had, you know, and at the time we had a really busy file, but it was like I had a lot of the responsibilities of senior management, but I was close enough to the front line that I also had some of those responsibilities. And I have actually found that it, it, with increasing responsibility, actually some, some of those issues have gone away. So you might think of it as this linear thing. The higher up I go in the, tra you know, the, the, the organization, the higher, you know, the more work and so on. I think that that's a little simplistic. So I think a lot of it has to do with the job you're going to as well. Uh, and there, you know, there, there can be jobs, and I, I personally have had this experience, where you know, the balance is really great until there's a crisis somewhere that makes your job the job in the hot seat. And you've all had this experience, I'm mm -hmm. sure, of colleagues. They might not even be a director or you might not even be in the EX ranks. But it's, you know, their unit's file is the one that's on the front page of the paper every day. And they're working you know, every day and weekends you know, for months on end. So I think you know, the important thing is, it, it is you know, I think it's really important that we're having this conversation. And, that, you know, and, that, and, it's, and it's actually quite laudable that there are people who are saying you know, that they're, they're actually saying, no, that's not for me. I mean, I think it's important that people are thinking about what they want out of life. And that, and that, frankly, management, you know, and, and employees are having these kinds of conversations. And I'm very respectful myself. I mean, you know, people have to make the choices that, are, that they're comfortable with. But I do think there are some myths out there. It is undeniably true that the higher up you go and the more responsibility you take on, the more demands there are on you. And there are jobs where the scope for you to balance work and family life are, is, are, is very low. I mean, there are jobs. I've had jobs. And I think I've been grateful because I, in one instance that I can think of, I had a manager who it was a fantastic job, and I, I wound up taking it, but it was very clear at the outset, if you come to work in this role, just won't get into the details, but given all the parameters around it, you have to understand that this is, you know, if, if, if you have to work, you have to work. And, and just and make sure that you've talked to your family and that everybody's, you know. So for me, you know, having a long conversation with my wife, you know, we agreed this was the right thing to do and so on. But you've got to make sure that your family's okay. Mm -hmm. but. Not every job is like that, and there are lots of places where the work might be, you know, might be significant, but you know what? There's a lot of flexibility to take it home or to come in early or you know, bring a laptop home or whatever, and I have, I have lots of colleagues who have flexibly managed that way, and if you can do that and advance your career and everything, then that might be okay too. So I, I guess um, I always want to know when I have someone say, well, I really you know, work life balance. Like, well, what exactly do you mean by that? Because the balance is going to change over the yeah. balance of your life. You know, the balance is different with every job. There are many jobs where you can make an accommodation. But there is a basic equation, which is the more responsibility you take on, you know, the more work there's going to be. And it's just, you know, but I'm not sure that it's always impossible to find accommodations that will work. Good point. I agree. If, uh, if I may add also, I think it's a question of flexibility. I think if both parties are honest and open and you do whatever works for you, you talked about taking a laptop home. I think that technology has... Uh, help but also being a little dangerous we've all heard stories of people getting email from their bosses at 11 at night expecting an answer before seven the next morning so we know there are some extreme cases out there but the technology is there to help us and and all of the policies and unflexible work schedule and all of that so i think there's there's a lot to play with it might be time to redefine exactly what we mean by by work-life balance for everybody do we have any other questions we still have a bit of time one from So we have a question from the web. Um, the issues at the management table are generally big. That's why they're elevated there. As a CFO or CAE, you occasionally have to bring issues that are not fun for one of your colleagues to answer. Yeah. This could create conflict. Do you, um, do you have any secrets to success in managing conflict with management team colleagues? Well, for me, 
I certainly use the no surprise approach. I mean, you don't want to go at the executive table and your job is not to embarrass your colleague or make them, they're not prepared to have the discussion. So as the chief audit executive, I had made sure we had good due process audit reports before they would be finalized, even before the issues would be discussed with the deputy heads, uh, I would have had an opportunity to brief uh, the ADM responsible for the program. So there is a good exchange because again, those are, those are your partner, you're part of the team. So you will need them one day and you have to mm -hmm. work with them. So for me, it's a no surprise approach. Uh, when I said I have to be uh, fair and be, appear to be fair, Again, even on the financial management side, sharing with them the information in advance that we would be discussing, seeking their input in terms of the analysis we had done in advance of. So most of the time you can do that and it's important that you do. You may get caught off guard where you are at the meeting uh, of the executive committee and you're being asked and you haven't time to do the due process, but you still have to put your opinion on the table. That's what the deputy is asking. It's the how you do it that will make it a winning situation versus a losing situation. But for me, it hasn't been a challenge because, you know, no surprise, we treat people with respect and you play together as a team and normally it works well. Yeah. Uh, maybe just to add to that, I think um, I, would, I was thinking exactly the same thing. The how is the, is the point that I think needs to be emphasized and that is, um, in, in a bit reflecting on what Simon said earlier in terms of the context and your, the context of your role is to help the organization. So if there's an issue that's nasty or uncomfortable to discuss, A, you need the courage to bring it to the table, but how you bring that and how you contextualize your perspective on that is absolutely critical. And auditors, uh, deservedly in some cases, have had a bad um, reputation for the gotcha kind of thing, right? Because, uh, you know, sometimes that feels good, right? You find a finding, you, get, ooh, you found something really meaty. We've got to let go of that. And, and my personal advice, and one, it's actually from one of my former clients, was to change the gotcha to instead of we've got, you know, we've got you, to no, we've got you. We've got your back. So, but we need to have this conversation in order to protect the organization, in order to understand what the issues are that's facing it, because we have a common objective. This is not us against you. This is us working together as colleagues and as partners to find the um, to find the the best solution. Now, does that always work? No. I've had some. I've personally had some um, very uncomfortable conversations, irrespective of how I approach them. There will be some people that just, for whatever reason, don't want to hear it, and and that's where I think you need the grit, right? As auditors or or uh, uh, CFOs and, and and finance professionals is to be able to say, okay, we're gonna do our best to be constructive, but at the end of the day, sometimes you have to agree to disagree. Do you have to be a jerk about it? Please don't be a jerk <laughs> about it. I mean, I think that, that's really what comes yes. down to it because, again, to go back to the issue of trust and, and earning that seat at the table, you're not gonna get very far um, with that kind of an attitude, but I will say you will gain an awful lot of credibility and trust if you're able to do that in a way that is constructive. Yes. Um, but coming in guns a blazing and being, as I say, a jerk about it is going to get you absolutely nowhere. In fact, it'll it'll push you back. I you know I think um, Liette was saying at the beginning, you know, no surprises. I, I you know, uh, there's an element of basic human nature at work when you're around a, a table with a bunch of other people. Uh, you know, my organization, the organization that I have responsibilities for, Health Canada, it's a big place. You know, we have almost, we have 10,000 people. I, I think it's a well-run organization. I'm relatively new, so this isn't a pat on my back. But I think it's a well-run organization. But it's really big. And I know just, you know, logically that there are problems, you know, there are some problems in the organization somewhere. You can't run an institution that big without there being some things that could be done better. So I actually... I am happy if my controllership function is pointing out the areas that need fixing so that I can go and fix them. Actually, you know, the average dep uh, assistant deputy minister or director general, if you have the right kind of trust relationship you've built, they're going to actually be happy in a sense. They're going to want you to point these things out. What they won't want and what I wouldn't want as deputy is I wouldn't, I wouldn't want you know, I wouldn't want you know, Bill Matthews or somebody you know, to say you know, at, the, at the DM's breakfast, we did this thing at Health Canada, and boy, did we find a bunch of trouble, right? <laughs> because you don't want to be, 
you know, the last thing you want as a manager is to kind of, you know, look bad in front of your colleagues and so on. So I think, you know, rule number one, no surprises, do not be dropping stuff on the table. You know, I mean, the odds are almost 100% that whatever it is they found is not the personal failing of the ADM or whatever, but nobody likes to feel like their organization is, you know, being called out and pointed out in front of everybody else. But behind the scenes, they may well be actually grateful that you brought this issue to their attention, so they're able to fix it. So, I, you know, I think that, again, it comes down to interpersonal relations and just, you know, sensitivity and, frankly, again, to good judgment about uh, your job is to, in a sense, to be forthright about problems, to, you know, to kind of, to ensure this kind of appropriate, uh, that, you know, everything is kind of going according to the rules and so on, but uh, how you bring that, that forward and how you have that dialogue with management and being sensitive, frankly, to, you know, to people's egos. I have an ego, we all have an ego, it's nothing wrong with that, but being sensitive to how people are going to feel about having their stuff, you know, draped in, you know, in public at the management table, that's all a really important part of your job. And the key is to effectively advance all of this stuff without getting people's noses out of joint. So I do think no surprises and, and you know, so in this case, have a bilateral, you know, do it ahead of time, you know, maybe you come up with the problem but then also work on what the solution is. Like there's a lot of ways in which you can surface something without frankly doing it at the management table in a way that, that really calls people out and embarrasses them. Merci pour la question. Temps pour une dernière. Vous allez au micro, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour, mon nom est Christine de, de Finance. Euh, je dois vous remercier. C'était une très, très belle discussion. C'était vraiment une très bonne. Pour moi, ça a beaucoup rajouté de la valeur. Et ma question est concernant le, le terme « value added ». On entend beaucoup parler de ça. Euh, quand le, les employés font quelque chose, ils s'assurent qu'on ajoute de la valeur techniquement. Euh, ils s'assurent que c'est, euh, euh, le mot en anglais, c'est « accurate euh, ». Mais je me demande comment les, les senior euh, executives, comment vous déterminez que c'est de la valeur ajoutée, c'est un conseil qui a de la valeur ajoutée que vous avez devant vous. Quels sont les critères que vous utilisez pour déterminer que le conseil qu'on vous donne ajoute de la valeur. Et comment est-ce que vous faites, ça c'est le deuxième volet de ma question, comment est-ce que vous faites pour assurer que nous, staff, on ait l'information sur quel type d'information pourrait rajouter la valeur à vous? Je peux peut-être te donner un exemple que j'ai utilisé à quelques reprises avec le staff. Vous savez, souvent quand le sous-ministre va en comité parlementaire et puis le, le commissaire du service correctionnel y allait de façon très régulière au cours des dernières années, il y a donc une série d'analyses qui doivent être faites. On a toujours le gros cartable, maintenant le cartable est sur l'iPad, avec de nombreuses analyses financières qui sont préparées. Et puis moi, souvent, je me prépare, je suis avec lui. Puis la veille, ben j'ai plein d'autres questions qui n'étaient pas sur la liste que je leur avais données la veille. Fait que là, je reviens le matin, pouvez-vous me répondre à ça? Puis les gens font un travail, puis font un travail précis. Puis je leur dis, mais ce que j'ai commencé à faire pour qu'ils voient l'importance, à euh, un moment donné, je leur, je leur ai dit, allez dans mon bureau, pendant que je vais être en comité parlementaire avec le commissaire, écoutez les questions qui lui sont posées. Vous allez voir l'importance, quand je dis l'importance d'avoir des données adéquates sur le coût de nos programmes. Il se fait souvent poser la question. Puis vous savez, si on n'a pas le bon chiffre, qu'est-ce que ça pourrait vouloir dire? Puis on a eu des discussions souvent sur des questions médiatiques qui étaient là. Encore une fois, puis leur dire, c'est important, le travail que vous faites pour nous va nous permettre de mettre la bonne information. Fait que pour moi, c'est une façon qui était assez simple, puis de revenir après un comité parlementaire, puis de dire merci aux gens, puis de dire, tu sais, ta question que je t'ai posée ce matin, on l'a exactement eue, alors merci pour ton travail. L'autre, probablement, ça sera au prochain comité. Alors, je te donne ça comme exemple, mais pour moi, ça vaut, ça vaut beaucoup. Puis, j'encourage je, je, mes gestionnaires aussi à dire merci à leurs gens, puis à leur donner de la rétroaction. Puis, j'ai quand même une approche de porte ouverte. Alors, souvent, puis euh, Robert et Kitty, qui a déjà travaillé pour moi, le sait très bien. Si on travaille sur un sujet, je dis au gestionnaire, amène tes gens pour qu'on puisse avoir une bonne discussion. Puis, encore une fois, souvent, je prenais le temps de faire le lien avec le travail qu'ils ont fait et l'objectif que je tente de viser. Alors, pour moi, c'était une façon. Puis, je te dirais que si ton superviseur ne le fait pas, pose-lui la question. Souvent, les gens oublient que c'est important de refaire le lien 
pose lui ou pose euh, la question à ton superviseur et puis le lien pourrait être fait. Puis toi, ça va te donner une meilleure appréciation de la valeur de ton travail. Autre réaction? Um, alors, um, pour moi, la question de valeur ajoutée, ce n'est pas, euh, pas comme une formule, un formulaire, ce n'est pas, pas, pas quelque chose d'exact. Euh, mais pour, pour moi, quand je pense au concept, euh, c'est un peu comme ça. Alors, euh, tous les employés, chaque employé a leur propre, propre responsabilité, ils ont le, leur fonction. Et c'est possible de, 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 de faire votre fonction et juste arrêter là. Juste, juste faire votre job et c'est tout. Mais chaque jour au bureau, il y a la possibilité d'amener de, 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 au bureau, d'apporter au bureau une valeur euh, qui est une valeur en addition à votre job jour à jour, votre, vos responsabilités jour à jour. Alors, juste, juste pour donner quelques exemples. Uh, pour moi, comme sous-ministre, je pense qu'une de mes valeurs, c'est non pas juste la fonction que je, les, les choses que je fais chaque jour au, au bureau, mais c'est d'avoir un, un réseau uh, un, un peu plus large ici à Ottawa, mais aussi dans le secteur uh, de, 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 de communauté d'affaires et puis avec les autres gouvernements, les provinces, etc. Ça, c'est pour moi, c'est bon. Je peux mieux servir le ministre, je peux mieux servir le gouvernement si j'ai un réseau et ce n'est pas juste moi dans mon bureau sans savoir, sans, sans des relations avec les autres, autres personnes. Et s'il y a un, 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 un dossier urgent ou s'il y a un problème, une catastrophe, moi, avoir un réseau comme ça, c'est utile. Alors moi, je passe un peu de temps chaque mois, pas beaucoup de temps, mais un peu de temps à élargir mon réseau, le réseautage. Je sais, il euh, y a des gens qui ont des différentes perspectives sur le, sur le réseautage. Moi, je pense que le réseautage est important. Moi, je, je n'aime pas les gens qui passent toute leur journée avec le réseautage. Alors, ça, c'est pour, pour être axé sur votre emploi. Oui, il y a un équilibre. Mais, et vous, vous, vous voyez ça, je pense que euh, plus souvent dans le secteur privé, il n'y a pas de question pour les, 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 les gens d'affaires qui ont des, 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 des postes. Euh, élevé dans les banques et les, les grandes entreprises, le réseautage est vraiment important. Mm -hmm. ils, ils sont membres de, de, des conseils d'administration, mm -hmm. des charités, mm -hmm. des hôpitaux, bla, bla, bla. C est, c est, il y a un certain… un des raisons pour laquelle ils font le réseautage, c'est parce qu'il y a une valeur ajoutée pour, pour leur entreprise, pour leur organisation. Alors, ça, c'est juste un exemple pour moi. Alors, moi, je pense que, OK, un, un, une portion de ma valeur ajoutée, c'est d'avoir un bon réseau. Alors, je, je passe un peu de temps chaque mois, un ou deux heures, ou, ou, en, 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 en faire le réseautage. Euh, un autre exemple, euh, moi, j'ai passé beaucoup de temps euh, au passé au bureau de conseil privé et j'étais responsable des de comités du cabinet, gérer des comités de cabinet. Alors, j'ai passé beaucoup de temps dans les réunions du cabinet. Alors, chaque réunion a un propre euh, ordre du jour, trois ou quatre euh, points sur l'ordre du jour. Mais de temps en temps, il y avait des discussions entre les ministres, des discussions spontanées, spontanées où, où il y avait des choses qui, qui étaient là sur la table, qui n'étaient pas nécessairement directement axées sur les trois ou quatre points sur l'ordre du jour, mais qui étaient de l'information très importante pour un autre ministère. Ou, ou, euh, ou pour un autre ministre, un sous-ministre. Alors, sans divulguer des, des secrets ou de faire des choses qui n'étaient pas appropriées, moi, j'ai développé une pratique de passer un peu de temps sur le téléphone. C'est important pour vous de, de, de savoir que il y avait une discussion en cabinet et puis il y a une préoccupation sur sujet X ou il y a des tendances va dans cette vont dans cette direction. Ça, c'est une intelligence qui est difficile pour les autres sous-ministres d'avoir parce qu'ils ne passent pas tous les jours dans le cabinet. Alors, ça, c'est mm -hmm. une valeur… Je, moi, ce n'était pas dans mon description, dans mon job description, mm -hmm. mais ça, pour moi, c'était une valeur ajoutée. Moi, j'ai une perspective unique parce que moi, j'étais au bureau de conseil privé, unique dans le gouvernement et moi, je vais essayer d'ajouter un peu de valeur en, en passant information importante à mes collègues. C'est le même dans votre emploi. Je, je suis certain que dans votre, euh, dans, pour chacun de vous, il y a des opportunités de, 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 de passer l'information à vos collègues qui est une euh, inf information importante, de, 
de, de, de développer un réseau qui, qui, qui ajoute de valeur dans votre bureau. Alors, quand je parle, j'espère que j'ai m'expliqué OK, mais l'idée, c'est que vous avez un job, vous avez un poste, et il y a des gens qui pensent, OK, ça, c'est ma poste, ça, c'est la chose, seule chose dont je suis responsable. Non, 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 non. Valeur ajoutée, c'est de trouver d'autres d'autres euh, d'autres manières de, 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 de augmenter votre, votre, votre valeur à l'organisation. Alors, euh, et les opportunités seront différentes pour chaque personne, mais c'est vraiment de penser un peu, de, un peu sur comment est-ce que je peux ajouter un peu de valeur à mon, mon, mon boss et, et peut-être à mes collègues. Ce n'est pas juste le boss, mais c'est les collègues, peut-être mm -hmm. les autres dans l'organisation. Il uh, y a toutes sortes d'opportunités de faire ça. Mm -hmm. Merci. Christine, je vais répondre en anglais, si c'est OK. Excellent question, and I'm glad you raised it. And I, I think I would reflect on what Simon was saying as well around your unique position. Um, and I know you're from Internal Audit, and this, I think that the same um, argument goes across uh, both sides of the controllership uh, group here. We have with Internal Audit, you've got a bird's eye view of the organization, and you have questions you have to answer in the course of your audit. You have an audit objective or two or three that you have to answer. And doing, answering those questions is valuable. Answering questions beyond that or giving insight and foresight as a result that goes further than those audit questions is really where it's value added. Everything you should do should have value, but we, we mustn't forget the, the opportunity we have in doing the qu inquiries we're doing in audit and, and really um, uh, solving problems. We have a huge potential to solve problems for the deputy or for the ADM or whoever the client is. and um, Oftentimes we get stuck on that audit objective and we say, yes, we're done, tick, it's a compliance audit or it's a management control framework audit or, or something. But it, you are in an enviable position to dig into the nature, the very nature of the business that you're serving and be able to think from the perspective of the deputy or your client, what is the problem they are trying to solve? How does this piece of work that I'm doing either directly or indirectly solve a problem? And then do it. And then advise on those problems. So we, you know, the research that Jennifer quoted uh, earlier, we said, you know, there's three, there's three value propositions that internal audit anyway has. The first is to contribute to oversight, and that's great. We do that through assurance. The second is to give insight into problems, the strategic advisor, and the truly, you know, the the the, the third, and it really I think is the high end of, of value is foresight. How do we translate what we know and what we found into um, intelligence, future-oriented intelligence for the client. And if you can sit back, and ideally if you get the feedback that Liette was talking about from the client uh, that says, thank you, you've solved the problem for me, that is exactly the pinnacle to me of value added that you can be, uh, you can be comforted. Will we sometimes have to state by our, by our mandates, state the obvious? Yes. That is part of our job. Sometimes we go back and we don't, you know, that's not really particularly helpful, but sometimes that's what you have to state. But uh, if you can always search for those opportunities to stretch and to answer the questions of the day of management uh, beyond just the audit objectives, then I think that's going to stand you in good stead. Merci. Merci pour la question. Euh, un autre truc simple que j'ai appris euh, par un superviseur tôt dans ma, dans ma carrière, c'est après que vous avez préparé quelque chose, demandez-vous à chaque fois, so what? Yeah. <coughs> and then make sure it's answered in whatever you're preparing, and that will give you a sense that you have uh, provided value. So believe it or not, we're already out of time. I would like to thank our panelists for uh, their candid insights and advice today. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Uh, I hope you found the information useful. We do appreciate your feedback. As I mentioned earlier, this is the second in our series. So whatever you, uh, you would like to share with us to make these sessions more beneficial for you in your, uh, in your development, please do email us. Uh, at this point, I guess, oh, on, on an administrative note, I'll let you know that uh, if you sign in, uh, if you've registered, you will receive your PD credit by email in, uh, in the coming days. And I can also tell you that our next session 
will be in December. The date will, uh, will be announced soon, and the theme will be uh, controllership leadership going beyond the numbers. So stay tuned for additional details. So for those of you joining us by webcast, thank you so much. It's our first time. I hope it went well. If not, let us know so we can work on, on our technology. And for the rest of you, please do uh, uh, join us for a little bit of uh, tele, uh, pardon me? Oh, 45 Great. people. Thank you so much. And actually, I want to thank our, um, uh, our collaborators as well, CPA Canada and uh, IIA Canada. Maybe I'll give the last word to Carmen and let us know why it's uh, important for IIA to support this type of activity. Yes, thank you, Jennifer. And so let me take my hat off, panelist hat off, <laughs> IIA hat on for a moment. A uh, big, big thank you for, having, uh, for coming out to this. This is important for IIA because our mandate fundamentally is to support the supply of high quality internal audit professionals and leaders. And uh, you know, we started off today by talking about some of the innate challenges of, of developing uh, leadership. That you know, we have courses that you can come and take and get your certification, please do, if you don't have it already. Um, that's really, really critical. But the, uh, increasingly, we're looking for ways to, to engage in these kinds of leadership discussions and, and tackle the intangibles. Uh, such as this uh, this topic. So very, very helpful. And, and if you have any feedback for us as well, as Jennifer suggested from her side, we're always looking for new avenues to try to support the community and to partner as well. Also very important to, par to partner with our very important par uh, uh, friends at CPA Canada. So the more we stay together, we're, we're very connected, the, the better it is for everybody. So big thank you for, for that. Merci beaucoup. Bon weekend, tout le monde. It was a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you. It's great. Thanks, yeah. Evan. Thank you very Thank much. You. That was Hope great. That was okay. Yes, it was. It was great. You and I agreed, so yeah. I was thinking, you know, you go after the deputy, what if he says so, oh, something you? totally different? Sure, this time, you have to talk to my deputy, it's time to say to yeah, change my job. It was really neat. That's great. And it's on, so this, the link you gave me, is, it, it should be there. There we go. Thank you. See all these ones that happened, like the, the I go, like all the yeah. things that are still there. Fantastic. Oh, good. Thanks. Thanks. There's, a, there's coffee and water. Feel free to stay. Our panelists will stay for a little while. Again. Thank you. Yeah, I know I have to uh, find the thing. Are you going to stop recording? I've stopped recording, but it's up.